to what we think will be an extremely promising session uh, on the immense impact uh, deep learning and machine learning is having on ophthalmology. As you know, this field has exploded, and in order for us to understand and have a rich discussion, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Joan Miller chair this session along with a panel of really distinguished uh, experts in the field. It gives me real pleasure to introduce Dr. Miller. Very briefly, it's hard to do it briefly. Uh, a lot of you know her. Uh, she, in her own right, is a globally renowned clinician and scientist. Many of the seminal discoveries we've seen in applications in ophthalmology, she has been instrumental in having a hand in. Um, she is the uh, David Glendening Cogan Professor and Chair of Ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School, chairs the department at Mass Ironier and at Mass General. But what to me, from a distance seeing the immense growth she's uh, led in ophthalmology at uh, Harvard has been really very impressive. And today it probably is the leading academic center in uh, the US and because of my international uh, focus, I would dare say the world too. Dr. Miller. Thanks, Mahul. I'm going to have you introduce me all the time. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. Hopefully you got your lunch and uh, some drinks and are relaxed and going to enjoy our session. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce my co-moderator first, Lucia Sobrin, who is an associate professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School. She is a retina and uveitis specialist uh, in her clinical realm. She is also the director of the Morse Laser Center at Mass Eye and Ear. Her primary research interests are the epidemiology and genetics of diabetic retinopathy and uveitis, and as well, investigating ophthalmic imaging in those conditions. Lily Peng is our guest speaker. She came in on a red eye tonight, because she, or this morning, since she's so tough from California. She's a product manager at Google. She's a non-practicing physician. She trained as a bioengineer and uh, received her medical degree, did those, uh, her education at Cal Berkeley and UCSF. She now leads a team that works on applying deep learning and other Google technologies and expertise to medical imaging. Uh, her team has developed a deep learning algorithm capable of interpreting diabetic retinopathy from retinal fundus photographs, which has been validated in, in different populations and several other projects, and I'm sure we'll get into more of that uh, this morning. Next is Lloyd Aiello. Uh, Lloyd Paul is one of our panelists. He's a professor of ophthalmology at Harvard, director of the Beetham Eye Institute at Jaws and Diabetes Center. He's a retina specialist and expert in retinal diabetic eye disease. He is also part of uh, the team, along with me and others, that identified the key role of VEGF in neovascular retinal disease, leading to anti-VEGF treatments, which we use. He is the inaugural chair of the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network, which is a national collaboration uh, to further clinical research in diabetic uh, retinopathy. Uh, next is John Miller at this end, a panelist, uh, as assistant professor of ophthalmology at Harvard, retina specialist and director of, medical, of retinal imaging at Mass Eye and Ear. His research is in structure function correlation and retinal disease, as well as investigating uh, investigational retinal imaging devices. And that Lou Pasquale, we, we've uh, allowed a, a glaucoma specialist to sneak in here, Lou. <laughs> because we know that's of interest uh, and, and in this particularly in this arena. Uh, he is a glaucoma specialist and director of both the glaucoma service and the ophthalmology telemedicine program at Mass Eye and Ear. Uh, his research is in the interaction of genes and environment in glaucoma and the application of telemedicine to glaucoma detection and management, as well as structure function uh, correlation in uh, glaucoma imaging as well. And professor of ophthalmology, I'm not sure if I, I got to that, I distracted myself. But thanks so much. I really want to thank our panelists and Lily, especially for traveling out here. Uh, and I'll turn this over to Lucia. And I think we'll let our, our panelists uh, sit back so they can see the slides. I'm going to give a short introduction both to the topic at hand and also to the way the panel will run today. So we're here because ophthalmology is sort of at the forefront of AI implementation among different specialties, and that's because eye diseases are readily and very precisely imaged. And so there's been an explosion <coughs> of development in this area for the assessment mainly of retinal and optic nerve diseases. This is a smattering of the publications that have come out in recent years for this. But the future really is now for ophthalmology uh, and AI, 
This is the uh, FDA website news release showing that the FDA has now approved the first AI-based device to detect diabetic retinopathy. This was April 11th, 2018, so barely, not even two weeks ago. The device that was approved is made by IDXDR, and the way it works is that fundus cameras are employed into primary care offices. An operator that's trained takes a picture of the patient's eyes. These are uploaded uh, to the IDXDR client on the local computer. They are analyzed, and then you, in a few minutes, you get a result. If it's negative, it means the picture was good enough to grade, and they find either mild or less diabetic retinopathy, and the result is come back in 12 months. If there's more than, more than mild retinopathy, mild diabetic retinopathy, then the answer is to refer to a retina specialist or an eye care specialist for further evaluation. And so we're there. This is now approved. It could be implemented today. But there's more than just diabetic retinopathy. Lily will be speaking because most of the work Google has done has been in the diabetic retinopathy world. We'll be speaking in depth about diabetic retinopathy. But then into the panel, we will talk more about other areas in ophthalmology where this can be implemented. Beyond just detecting diabetic retinopathy on fundus photographs for diabetic eye disease, there are, it still has not been touched the area of wide field imaging and also looking at optical coherence tomography, which is this imaging modality demonstrated here uh, where we can find almost histologic-like detection of the retinal layers and pathology within them. Age-related macular degeneration is another disease with very important public health implications. Again, it's very easily imaged both on fundus photographs, on autofluorescence, and on OCT. And we'll talk about where that work lays, lies right now. And finally, glaucoma, a blinding disease, also very common, also with large public health implications that is readily imaged. So we'll be touching on these following issues. First, the drivers and barriers for integration of AI into ophthalmology, how we think this is going to improve care and lower costs, what risks we're dealing with, and particularly in particular privacy issues when it comes to retinal photographs, and then just the logistical challenges of how we're going to implement these things. And so now it's my pleasure to invite Lily to come up and tell us a little bit about the Google work in diabetic retinopathy, and after that we will start with the panel. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, as uh, I've been introduced, my name is Lily. I'm a product manager at, um, at Google, and my team works on uh, deep learning for uh, medical information, but in particular medical imaging. So um, uh, I'm pretty sure this audience is pretty savvy to what DR is, so I'm not going to go belabor the point. Um, but I think what's really interesting about deep learning in particular um, and, disease and you know, diseases in general is that deep learning um, is really good uh, for tasks where you've done 10,000 times and for the 10,000 first time you don't want to do it anymore. Uh, and so this is particularly true for screening, uh, for screening use cases. And in the case of DR, it is the fastest growing cause of preventable blindness uh, and there are a lot of people who need to be screened. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, in terms of cost effectiveness, DR screening is probably one of the most cost effective um, screening programs we have. Um, so cost effective that the NHS is still pays for it, even though they're broke. Uh, and so another thing about DR that makes it a pretty good starting point for um, uh, deep learning is that uh, in general, doctors have agreed on a scale. Well, 
various scales to grade them. Uh, it's, it's difficult to train a machine if you don't know what to train it for. Uh, and so once there are standard guidelines that um, roughly we have agreement around, especially like an ICDR scale or ETDR uh, um, S scale, uh, it makes it a lot easier than at that point, or well, makes it feasible to even train a machine. Um, so uh, this, is, this is sort of the background and setting for why DR is a particularly interesting problem to start with in terms of deep learning uh, for, for a, a medical application. Uh, and in particular, you know, uh, one of the, in, one of the um, places where we think ML can make the most difference is where there is a limited uh, supply of expertise. Um, and that applies everywhere, but um, it's very, very much true in medicine where there's generally go globally a, um, uh, um, shortage of physicians and medical expertise. Um, and in India in particular, where we've done a lot of our work, uh, there's a shortage of 127,000 eye doctors there. And as a result, about half the patients actually suffer some form of vision loss before they're diagnosed. Um, and this was a study that was commissioned by um, the uh, Queen Elizabeth Jubilee Trust, where they actually went through and looked at the folks with um, DR. Um, th this is what they found, unfortunately. And so uh, our early work was, a, was started a few years ago where we uh, um, decided, you know, why don't we try to adopt a, a adapt a deep neural network to do this task. Um, and so what we did here, this is um, early work and we've made improvements to this, but this I think is an uh, interesting sort of um, background to how these models are trained is, you know, we got a lot of images, about 130,000, uh, and we hired uh, 54 ophthalmologists to grade these images. And initially, when we first started grading, we thought, oh, well, you know, one or two diagnoses per image would be enough because, you know, doctors are gold standard. Um, but what we found was that, you know, doctors' opinions do uh, differ. And for some of these images, we really needed three to seven, you know, diagnoses to get uh, some sort of ground truth. Now, um, th the ground truth we got was a majority decision. And, and you know, that was what was um, published in the JAMA paper. But, you know, I think, uh, uh, that's one of the things that you know we I think we are working on to figure out a better ground truth. But for the purpose of this paper, um, this work, we just use the majority decision. Um, and so, using the 54 ophthalmologists, they rendered about 880,000 diagnoses um, on this five-point ICDR scale. Uh, and we took all this data uh, and put it into a convolutional neural network. Uh, so this particular network here is um, called Inception. Uh, and it's a pretty well-known network that um, we've used uh, for a lot of other Google um, products, uh, mostly for image search or uh, photos. Um, and this used, classically used to classify you know, cats and dogs. And we just trained it to classify fundus images. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note was when we trained this network, we also uh, realized that we uh, had to train what we call housekeeping um, predictions. Uh, some things like image quality or if this is a left or right eye, um, what is the field of view in the image. And we realized that these things are actually quite important in the implementation algorithm. So it's not just the diagnosis, but it's also all the other things that you need to keep track of when you're looking at an image. So what we did was um, roughly we, uh, when, when, when I say we trained a neural network, what does that really mean? Well, and in general, uh, we have two major types of, uh, of data sets that we use. One we call the development data set, and then the, the next uh, group we call the clinical validation set. So development data set is just what it sounds like. It's what uh, is used to develop the model. And that's roughly um, split into two uh, sets. One is the train set, where the model kind of experiments and learns. And then the tune set, where the model is, um, reads out its performance. And so that was the 130,000 images we used to train and uh, develop the algorithm. Uh, and then we uh, test these algorithms on clinical validation sets, so data sets that the um, algorithm has never learned on or never seen before. Uh, and so in a, the JAMA publication, we used two. One was the Messerdor 2, which is pretty well-known uh, data set. And then another one was a bigger one on, uh, called IPAX1. Uh, and so, uh, this was a, one of the main figures from the JAMA publication, um, and it showed for the 9,900 uh, image data set for the IPAX um, trial. We did fairly well, about uh, a little bit better than the median ophthalmologist. Uh, and, and again, this is a majority decision on calling uh, moderate or above um, DR. Uh, so uh, the colored dots are the ophthalmologist, and then the black line is the algorithm. So that's, th that's the JAMA work. And of course, uh, 
beyond training the algorithm, we also uh, had developed a front end, so um, a place where you can actually drag and drop these photos. Uh, and we, we um, built this so that this could be uh, studied in clinical studies at, with our partners at Arvind and Sankara in India. So, okay, so that's a recap. So what's next? Um, well, there are two major things that we think are quite important um, uh, to, to work on. One is understanding um, better reference standards. So in general, with deep learning, uh, you know, we have a saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? So you, if you train the model to predict um, uh, noisy labels, it'll predict noisy labels, it'll reproduce whatever you ask it to reproduce. And then the second part is explainability. So how do we get the network to explain to you how it's making a prediction? And we think both are pretty critical to uh, clinical adoption. So in terms of better reference standards, um, one of the things that we've been working on is a finer grading scheme. So we had a binary grading scheme uh, for the most part in, um, in the previous work, uh, and this is an opportunity to get a um, little more fine-grained. Um, in fact, you know, we've, we've seen that clinical practice is now changing um, even between mild and none. Uh, so these, this five-point grade is becoming more and more relevant. Um, Adjudication with retina specialists rather than, you know, general ophthalmologists. Uh, we found that it, this actually is quite important, and I'll go into that a little later. Um, incorporating OCT imaging for actually evaluating whether or not a patient has DME rather than using heart exudates as a proxy is another way of um, getting a better reference standard. And then the last part is a, um, a ultra-wide field or a wider field of view. Um, most of our work had been focused on the 45 degree field of view. Um, and of course, the more of the retina you see, the more of the disease you're able to catch. So uh, last year, or the, with the JAMA paper, uh, we showed that we were kind of on par with generalists. Um, in this paper in 2018, we started using adjudication and um, not surprisingly, the network is very good at also uh, co uh, recapitulating what maybe a panel of retinal specialists are, are saying. Um, and so if you look at the binary score, it does pretty well. Um, the specialists are in shades of orange and the generalists are in shades of blue. Um, and then uh, we also did a f comparison on five-point grading, which we use a quadratic weighted kappa to measure the agreement. And you can see the algorithm is right there kind of um, like in between the pack in terms of uh, the individual retina specialists and the, and the ophthalmologists. So the next um, part of the work that I wanted to highlight was around explainability. Um, so a lot of, um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how neural networks are uh, a black box. And while that is sometimes true, it's not completely true because there's been a lot of work right now um, that's done on trying to figure out uh, how the, uh, the uh, neural network is making a prediction. Um, and so there are many ways of doing this. Um, this particular way is called, we, are, we nicknamed it Show Me Where, which is uh, because this shows you where in the picture, it creates a heat map to show you which pixels are most predictive for your prediction. So in this case, uh, you have um, a Pomeranian on your left, um, and you could see there's something about the face of the dog that makes this particularly Pomeranian knee. Uh, and then of the, the Afghan hound is um, there, and it's a, there's a sort of a, a heat map around where the Afghan hound is right here. So we use the same thing uh, for DR. Uh, and so this is a picture of MALDR, and uh, I can tell it's MALDR because it looks perfectly normal to me. Um, but to the network, uh, it's picking up the microaneurysms. So you could see there are some small microaneurysms around the macula and kind of um, uh, super temporally. This is a case of moderate DR, and um, there are very obvious hemorrhages, uh, kind of, and, um, and lesions across the, uh, the image. This particular example I really like because there are two artifacts on the image, here and here and the network's ignoring both. So, so that's explainability, and we're, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done there, but um, so far, uh, we're, we're, get, we're getting a sense that the network is protect, pr um, probably doing the right thing. Um, so what's next? Well, um, as, uh, as Lucia uh, um, 
mentioned, there's a lot to do in terms of uh, getting uh, things through clinical trials and you know approved by the FDA uh, and CE marked, et cetera. Um, and beyond that, you know, regulatory approval is great, um, but also understanding how these products actually get implemented in healthcare systems is also quite important. So those are all um, pieces of work that are being done right now. Um, and we're working, you know, one of our focus is one of our initial partners were in India. Um, and so a lot of our focus has been um, making sure that the uh, solution deploys well there. Um, in addition, we are partnering with, uh, through our Alphabet, um, sister Alphabet company, Verily, uh, we've been partnering with um, Nikon and Optos. They make really easy to use hardware. And one of the things that we've noticed when, uh, as we were doing this work, is uh, that if you can't take a good picture, you can't get screened. And so we didn't want the hardware to be a barrier to screening either. So there are many solutions to, you know, making sure everyone gets screened. AI is one piece of it, and there's tons of other pieces that need to f um, fall into place before that happens. So as, I, as we mentioned, there are many additional applications in ophthalmology. I won't cover them because then we could be here forever. Uh, but um, OCT, uh, DeepMind, our friends at DeepMind have done some work around OCT and um, actually in, with other uh, groups as well. Um, and then with AMD um, and uh, glaucoma. So lastly, I wanted to cover uh, a, a new sort of way of using deep learning. So a lot of what I've said before was how deep learning can be used to sort of recapitulate what we can see. Um, you you want to do that, you know, 10,000 and one first task. Um, what we've noticed is that actually, as we were doing this, that maybe perhaps deep learning can be actually used to make completely new novel discoveries. So it can be supportive of research. Um, and this is actually an interesting story. We had a, um, a new software engineer who've never, who had never done machine learning before, and she was volunteering her time with our group well, back when our group was really tiny, um, and she wanted to learn um, machine learning, and she didn't really know how to do that. So we said, well, you know, okay, what, we, what do we have lying around? Well, we have a lot of fundus images, and we have a lot of ages and you know, sex attached to the fundus images as labels. Well, why don't, we, why don't you train a network to predict these things? And we assume that you know, for age, well, if you can predict it within a decade or two, we're pretty happy about that. And then you know, um, the gender or the sex thing, well, the AUC should be 0.5. That's a good control for you. And that's what we said to her. And so she went and she trained an algorithm. She came back and she said, oh, yeah, age, I could tell within like you know, five, 10 years. And gender, I can tell you know, it's like AUC of 0.7. Uh, and we said, mm, that's probably wrong. There's some contamination with the training set. You know, go back, fix it. And so we asked her to train it again. And then she came back. She's like, well, the AUC now is 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.95. Uh, and at some point, we thought, OK, this is not an artifact. This is actually something interesting there. Um, and one of the things that we had thought was, well, age and you know, sex, they're actually pretty strong components in predicting cardiovascular risk, potentially. And um, there's some interesting literature showing that there are, there are some things that maybe you can you know, see in the, in, uh, in the fundus for cardiovascular risk. Um, and so we started kind of pulling on that thread a little bit. Um, and so uh, we actually ended up um, predicting, we didn't have enough um, uh, cardiovascular events in the data set that we were working on, um, but we did have enough uh, cardiovascular risk factor um, uh, predictions, so age, sex, uh, blood pressure, uh, smoking status. And so we were able to predict, uh, we realized we were, we were able to predict a lot of these, um, and that was in a paper that in Nature Biomedical Engineering that was published at the end of last year. Um, interestingly, we also did try, even with the few hundred examples, we did try predicting a five-year um, risk of a major adverse cardiovascular event. Uh, the AUC for that was 0.7, which is so, sort of in line with um, some of the, uh, the you know, Framingham-based or SCORE-based um, cardiovascular risk factors out there. So anyway, this is very interesting beginning work. Um, I think there's clearly a lot more to do. Um, and in terms of even getting more data to actually make sure that this is a, a task that a, a deep neural net is, is trained to do. Um, but uh, it, clearly there's a lot of promise here in terms of you know, not just predicting cardiovascular risk, but predicting other types of outcome-based predictions that we're interested in. So um, you know, there's a lot of uh, opportunities, not just within ophthalmology for deep learning. I've listed a few there. Um, and just a little plug, one of the things that uh, I'm very extremely excited about is uh, the fact that uh, some a lot of these technologies are open source and available for everyone, and I mean everyone to use. Uh, and so TensorFlow is one example where our group um, at, at Google has kind of open, uh, opened a, a 
stand, standard framework for machine learning. Uh, it's called TensorFlow, and um, you know a lot of the work that has uh, that we've seen has been based on technologies like this. And so we're really excited um, about what deep meta, uh, deep learning plus open source tools uh, can bring for medicine. So that's it. On the heels of uh, Lily's talk, we're going to spend the first part of the panel talking about diabetic retinopathy a little bit because it's at the forefront of what we can do in ophthalmology with AI. Then we're going to go to glaucoma, talk a little bit about AMD, and then wrap up with what Lily just alluded to, which is sort of the potential for discovery and what we can do outside of just clinical applications. So starting with diabetic retinopathy, Lloyd, now that we have IDXDR available, how do you see that rolling out? What do you see as the, do you see primary care doctors ordering them tomorrow? How are you ready to accept all the new referrals that will be coming down the line? What are the sort of the barriers that you see or the, the opportunities you see? Well, I think it's, it's still very uh, early on to be able to answer that type of question. We really don't know how well this operationalizes. Uh, we, we have the training within the population they did, but we also don't know how it does in, in unique populations and so forth. Uh, I think this type of use is going to be very important. That particular uh, approval at this point is basically for, you know, worst of mild disease or, or minimal disease. So it's a good initial sort of uh, triage from that, uh, but that still is a very large percent of the population that's going to be referred over. So one of the key things when we set up anything, we saw this big time in uh, telemedicine uh, as we were trying to do that, is that you have to have the ability to handle the flow of what you catch. And given the fact that uh, we have you know, hundreds, 400s of millions of uh, patients with diabetes out there, all of which are at risk for retinopathy, and half of those don't have the disease, we're going to have to be able to handle that flow. Uh, I think if the as the technology proves that it's good across the populations, that it's a referring disease, it's going to be very, very important. But all those support systems down the way are going to be critical if we're going to then be able to bring the care to the patients uh, that have that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how, how you see insurance coverage moving in this arena? How, how is that going to work? This is a new world for insurances. Maybe there are a few telemedicine analogies, but it's a little bit of a new world. It, it's a completely new world, and, and uh, reimbursements is all of a world unto itself anyway. Uh, so uh, I, I would be loath to predict that. But the, the, the issue is going to be clearly, a, as these modalities, and we now seem to the first FDA approval, uh, have the ability to uh, do this appropriate screening. It's a really major, critical uh, disease into the around the world, uh, whereby we now have very, very good treatments. If we can get the patients in the appropriate times, we can prevent the vast majority of the visual loss from these conditions. So it's really a social mandate to get this done. And this is really the first time that we have a way now of scaling this to hundreds of millions of patients times two eyes per patients times routine lifelong evaluation. So I think it's going to be critical that the support is there. And one of the barriers is going to be what is the reimbursement model going to be? How quickly are they going to be willing to do that? And will that drive the uh, quickly from the beginning the implementation and use of this technology? Lily, do you have any other additional thoughts about, you know, this is often touted as improving quality of care in the long term and lowering costs, but we're going to be hopefully reaching a lot more people. So what, can you comment sort of how you think about um, these screening and being implemented in the long term? Yeah, I think, oh, wow, I'm echoey. Well, so first of all, uh, I think I agree with, you know, um, uh, uh, Lloyd completely about, uh, so the, uh, how early we are and, and um, how we don't really know um, a lot of these, these things. I think what's really interesting uh, um, about um, automation, or at least, you know, in, in this case, uh, deep learning based automa automation is that uh, you actually do have, um, because it's so accurate, you do have a chance of, if implemented correctly, of bending the cost curve, right? So um, for the most part, utilization and cost has been just basically a proportional linear relationship, um, you know, historically. Um, but with, um, with you know, kind of automation that actually utilization, you build the algorithm, you have setup costs, but then over time, you, um, the more utilized the kind of cost kind of stays more flat, right? So your incremental cost is actually quite small compared to your setup costs. Um, and so it's actually quite interesting that actually allows you to think about reimbursements in different ways, right? So uh, 
do you reimburse when you find something, right? Do you reimburse for outcomes, that sort of thing? There's actually really kind of interesting ways that you can then look at reimbursements. Now, I'm not a reimbursements expert, nor am I really an ophthalmology expert, so I'm just kind of, you know, guessing from like sort of like an engineering first principles on why this is particularly exciting. I think if you can move that screening point to an early, you know, to the local offices, primary care endocrinologist that is big for the patients. I mean, this is a population that has a really high appointment burden. There's a lot of demands on their time for multiple subspecialty visits. And if you can get that screening to occur more rapidly at an earlier time point, I think that can lower costs and, and really improve their follow-up because compliance is really a big issue that, that Walden was, was getting to as well. And it opens up a whole other area we haven't thought about really that much before. Remember, 45% or so of the patients with diabetes don't even know they have the disease. So particularly in high-risk environments then, or even in lower-risk environments due to the e you know, ease, rapidity, and if the cost points are right, you're going to be able to start to be able to screen just for the detection of retinopathy that may find the disease. I mean, we find this in, in many areas of underserved populations. A lot of times we look in the eye, and that's our first understanding of patient with diabetes. And this now allows us potentially to get to this percentage of the population that right now is not being accessed at all. At the prior, even endocrinologists right. or, or diabetologists. So we, we mentioned uh, a number of populations where this has been uh, uh, validated, but have we if you started to look at things like the Indian Health Service or other groups that would sort of validate in different populations, is that? Yeah, Lloyd and I are gonna you know, after no, <laughs> yeah after I'm after this. Um, <laughs> no, I uh, actually no, we're we're clearly um, so. Our focus has been uh, our clinical partners because the implementation partners are in India. That's where a lot of the focus has been. We also actually have some development partners in the U.S. Um, that done screening in the U.S. and um, predominantly underserved populations. Um, and so the algorithm actually does pretty well in, in, in those populations as well. So we're definitely, um, I, again, I think it's not, it's not just about the uh, ML. And I think the ML is a very small, important, but small and um, part of the equation. It's really about operationalizing. Um, and so a lot of the operationalization has already been done in a lot of these places, like the Indian Health Service, like the VA, where they figure out robust care pathways. And then when you add a little bit of ML, it actually you know, makes the system go faster. But if you just add ML in isolation, it doesn't get you anywhere. And in India, what's, what's the implementation like to likely to be there? I mean, that's a huge number of patients. Yeah, so, so <laughs> it's actually also interesting because India, we say India, like it's you know one, one place, but it's uh, all these different regions and all these little um, uh, different implementations and different hospitals. Um, so we're working with you know two particular systems, Shankara and Aravind, and they have these screening networks again. Uh, and so working, uh, so we're most far with Aravind. We've um, done some implementation with them and, and pilot sites to make sure that you know things are you know start small, make sure that the re referral pathways are you know open and we're we're doing it, the algorithm is performing at the level you know you want it to perform for, uh, and that sort of thing. So we're in the pilot phase validation, and then uh, over time um, probably uh, three, uh, um, bringing on new vision clinics and, uh, and others after we validate it in a few. It's going to be critical to grow in COVID too because it used to be you know. U.S. was the worst, and was India. Now China actually has got far more diabetic patients than, than India does, and they are even earlier. They have less robust screening programs and so forth at this point, and a more uh, disparate uh, uh, population base. And so it's going to be very uh, critical for that, not only to be able to distribute it, as you say, but then how, where do the patients that are caught from this go? How is that triaged within that? And even concepts of are the more you know, if if you have algorithms. Unlike what's FDA approved right now, that can take the more severe from the more moderate from the others. Do you treat those in different ways, given limited resources in underserved countries? When we talked a little bit about garbage in, garbage out in these <coughs> implementation trials that you're doing in India, what kind of rates of unreadable images? I know these are places that are very well staffed and very, and very well set up. What kind of rate of uninterpretable images are we looking at? Uh, so, because a lot of these systems, um, we choose the systems that have done teleretinal or you know have this network before, and they have mechanisms for training the technicians. The ungradable rates are pretty, are you know, kind of um, are lower, right? So I think uh, they're. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they're. Uh, we actually have an, the algorithm actually tells you whether or not it, an image is ungradable, so you can you know hopefully go and you know retake the image if if you find that it is ungradable. So that I think helps. Um, uh, quite a bit. So, um, uh, yeah, so we, w there's a lot of, uh, 
there's a lot of ways that you can actually even use AI to support uh, the workflow, right? So even if you never made a diagnosis and you were just able to give you know, a technician you know, feedback, um, and there's turnover for technicians. A lot of you guys know uh, that you know, the really good ones, they may not stay very long because they're really good and they you know, learn things very quickly. Uh, and so you get turnovers in the tech, um, technicians. So you can use using AI to actually help technicians uh, you know, learn faster or give better results. That's actually another um, really kind of um, very important implementation, um, a way of implementing uh, um, AI. You can comment a little bit about the compliance issues that we're going to face that are the same that as we faced in telemedicine, which is a patient gets screened and they said go go see an eye doctor and they never do. And now, how how do you see that? Uh, how do you see that challenge? I think that's one of the biggest issues is that we have, you know, a lot of we're going to be having a lot more patients and there probably needs to be a, a more established referral network that's directly either with the device that has a network established or. Uh, direct plug into general ophthalmology or as appropriate. But I think that is a, is a big issue is where do we place all these patients? Yeah, I'm not sure if people always realize how big an issue that is. We had a telemedicine program that we worked with at one point. We put a telemedicine program in. We had so many people coming back. We referred it to the ophthalmology group that we built the telemedicine program around. They had more than they could handle. And rather than bring more people on, they said, we can't handle this. And they shut the program down. <laughs> okay, so I don't think that's the right way to go. Okay, but I want to make sure we don't go that way. We need to be able to handle the type of volume that uh, this is going to do. In the past, it was always we can't scale any way of detecting this large. Now we can, and now we have to figure out how we're going to handle the referrals that are come in in a, in a way that protects the patients but also can be done with the resources we have. And I think as the technology gets better, too, it also may be able to detect interval changes in the same patient so that patient doesn't have to come to a subspecialty location for the follow-up care. So maybe that would be another way that we can revert in some of the visits um, and health compliance, because I think if you can have a visit where they're checking with their endocrinologist and also getting screened as well with photographs, um, that may be a way to increase compliance. Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, you know, it's not just um, large cardiovascular disease networks that happen to have plenty of photographs on board for doing some of the research that you talked about. A big concern was that retinal photographs are basically an identifier. And a lot, and they're used in our government to have people screen into high uh, security facilities. And so some of the investigators refused to participate because they were afraid, they were concerned that patients' identifiable information was gonna be released. Now in the context of healthcare, it's a little bit less uh, risky because we have privacy agreements, et cetera. But Lily, can you comment a little bit about privacy with retinal images? And I know that there's also the potential to do some of this on the sort of the outskirts of really a healthcare-based setting. How are you thinking about those issues of privacy? Oh yeah, so I mean, uh, so I, actually taking a step back, so fundus images, um, they're, they're actually not currently being used as identifier in any way. Uh, so because uh, I, I think, I think it, they often get confused with iris scans. Um, and so fundus images are much harder to take uh, and you have to sit still and take it. Uh, so because of that, they've kind of fallen out of favor in terms of any ways of identifying people. Um, and generally identifiers, and I'm not a lawyer, so you know, generally in terms of identifiers, what you think about is, you know, is there a large database of this that links to an identity, right? Um, so like in the case of social security numbers and driver's license and all that stuff, there's a database that links to your identity that can link to everything else. Um, and uh, in, in the case of, you know, blood samples, for example, you know, we can say blood samples are de-identified. Well, I mean, there's DNA in there. I mean, how, how are any tissues ever de-identified, right? And it's because you can't find these links between, you know, the, the overwhelming amount of work that you have to do to re-identify a sample, uh, that's kind of usually how people think about it. So in the case of, uh, in the case of retinal images, I think, you know, we are, uh, I mean, I, I think I would defer to, you know, the NEI or the National Institutes to see, you know, where, where they think this lands. Um, I do think that, you know, even if these are considered sort of, you know, private information, I mean, healthcare is private and there are ways, to, clearly there are ways to secure private information. Clearly there are mechanisms, you know, and uh, ethics review boards that review the research, even of things that um, potentially has PHI. Um, and so I don't think these are, you know, they need to be properly secured, encrypted, uh, and handled um, properly um, in a in, you know, HIPAA compliant manner. Um, but uh, I don't think that really, uh, 
I don't, I don't think that that precludes you know, additional research being done for it. It just needs, you, know, you just have additional security measures that are put on top of it. Um, and so uh, it, a lot of the work that we do, we actually treat um, a lot of the healthcare information, even though you know, there, our partners have said they're de-identified with a um, much higher level of security just because um, you know, we, we just wanna make sure that everything is secured. And just because something has been deemed de-identified doesn't always mean that it's completely. Uh, and so we try to actually um, secure uh, um, all sorts of healthcare information. Joel, do you want to comment more? Yes. Uh, as commenting as a, a non-member of the NIH, but uh, involved, uh, this is a very active area they're looking at now. Some areas of the government have uh, suggested that the retinal scans are now HIPAA, uh, covered by HIPAA. Uh, this has not come out of the NEI right now, which is actively looking at this and trying to figure out how to handle it. As you can imagine, it has major implications in how we do our research with that and the prior research that's been done from that regard. So there's not been a ruling on that yet, but it's, it's uh, they're really trying to look at, at how to handle this for all the purpose, reasons that uh, Lily pointed out. So uh, uh, it's something that they're gonna, that there's gonna have to be some resolution on in the near term and it is actively being uh, considered uh, because it's impacting large uh, studies uh, that are going on and where we go from here in this regard. I think it does impact uh, implementation from an analytics standpoint for some of the research, uh, whether you can do a cloud-based or you can, if the algorithms can be applied locally for some of these things as we move forward with some of the larger centers. Um, that's one way to keep it um, more HIPAA compliant. Yeah. The, the, the big concern though, of course, they have is that now when we set this up, there's a potential for the huge, these huge databases to be available. And once that happens, then that argument unfortunately goes uh, against it and makes it more of a, a HIPAA issue. I think that we've uh, we're co we've covered diabetic retinopathy pretty well. So Lou's been quiet here, but now we're gonna we're gonna start the Lou show. Lou, tell us a little bit just about where is AI in glaucoma? Where do you see it going? Where is it gonna be implemented? Is it gonna be optic nerve photos? Is, is it gonna be OCT? And you know, at what point in healthcare delivery are we gonna see it first? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that have been mentioned about diabetic retinopathy apply to glaucoma. It affects you know, millions of people, and in the United States, 50% of people are felt to have the disease and not know it. Uh, we also have the same problem of you can, you can have a screening and tell a patient that they, they have glaucoma and they don't show up for their follow-up visit. And so uh, that, that's uh, all of those things apply. Um, I think that there, there's two main areas where AI uh, I think three main areas where AI is have, could have an impact. One is the detection of the glaucoma di disc that is linked to manifest visual field loss. I think it can do that. Uh, you showed the, the Ting paper in your, in your first slide, uh, and um, they're showing excellent areas under the curve that are comparable to uh, the detection of diabetic retinopathy. So. It's, it's doable, uh, of course, in that paper, they were all Asian populations. We're far from the level of validation that we see in diabetic retinopathy. You know, is that um, scalable to other populations, Caucasians, African, et cetera, et cetera? We have no idea yet, but there's no reason to think that it wouldn't be. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, you know, coming along and uh, we're, we're involved in some research uh, evaluating uh, some of these AI platforms for the detection of the glaucomatous disc. I think Brian Song's in the audience here, and he's involved in a lot of this research as well, and we're presenting some data about this at Arvo. The second area is, you know, glaucoma is a little bit different. This is where glaucoma is different from diabetic retinopathy in that there's a functional loss that's attendant to the glaucomatous disc. And, and so how do you deal with that? And, and so, um, you know, in glaucoma, we have a hard time saying uh, what is progressive visual field loss. And AI can really help us with that, and, and it is. And we're already seeing there was some preliminary data at the American Glaucoma Society meeting in New York in early March uh, showing uh, some attempts at using AI to detect progression, and it looks like it's for real. Um, I think the third area that really goes underestimated, which is how it could help us in the clinic. And that's really important. You know, we, we, in the clinic, what we do is we look at a glaucoma patient and we say, well, your pressure is 14 millimeters of mercury. That appears to be uh, a pressure that's acceptable to you. Uh, and probably you won't go blind in your lifetime. But do we really know that? 
you know, we really don't. We're kind of guessing. We're making, a, we're making an educated guess based upon how much damage is there, how old the patient is, how long we expect the patient to live, but we really don't know. And this is where AI could really help us, and there's this thing called Kalman forecasting. Uh, that's just beginning. There was a paper in this month's issue of Ophthalmology using Kalman forecasting. You know, this is how they, they figured out how to get to the moon. You know, so they're trying to figure out how to prevent a patient from being where they are now to being functionally blind from glaucoma. And so they're using this to say, okay, this is what your target pressure should be. And, um, and this is exciting. And I think that it, uh, there's a lot of validation steps that, you know, diabetic retinopathy is far ahead but it's very exciting, and I think that, um, you know, with tweaking, uh, these algorithms can be used clinically to tell us, you know, what the target pressure should be for a particular patient. Lily, have you, uh, is Google doing any work in glaucoma yet? Do you have any other insights about where the first place you'd like to make an impact is? Yeah, so glaucoma uh, is, uh, we are, um, as Lee says, we're, or glaucoma, the work in glaucoma is um, very, is very early, uh, and, you know, part of the the issue is, you know, as machine learning scientists, where we look to the clinical folks and say, well, tell me what to predict, right? So <coughs> if you tell me to predict a cup to disc, we can predict a cup to disc, and we can, re, you know, kind of give you the, but is a cup to disc really that predictive, right? So we, I mean, it's, it's, we build tools to help kind of doctors make that diagnosis, but we kind of need the doctors to tell us, hey, this is a thing that you want to, um, you want to you want to know right um so that's kind of the first paradigm where we're saying we're, we're going to give you a readout on the image uh and and it's it just defined by, by what the physician wants um i think what we was referring to in his other examples are like um are the endpoints that you might be more interested in and it's just a hybrid of you know uh, understanding where the patient is now and where the patient might be later uh, and that's a little bit of a more of a discovery type of thing. And I think that there are some things that we can do um, for potentially in terms of deep learning for, for that type of work. Um, so it's really exciting to see that people are applying it that way. Um, but, uh, but you know, and it, it, it's going to be a much harder task because then you need to find, you, I mean, even now it's like, well, how do you, um, even the treatment of glaucoma is like, you know, predicting when a person will be treated for glaucoma, is that the endpoint you want? Um, and we've heard people say, well, people treat glaucoma very in very different ways. Some people treat very early, some people treat very late, so we don't really know. And so then you're like, okay, well then, wh you know, what do you predict? Do you predict the functional field loss, like the visual field loss at the end? But there are not very many populations where you like literally just don't intervene, right? That, that's terrible. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're stuck um, at uh, actually go getting good definitions of the problems. Um, and so if I think if the clinical community can actually you know, agree on a definition in some point, that, that makes the ML actually you know, work a lot better. So. Sounds like our lunch table discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Different lunch table. Good. Any, anything else to add across the panel for glaucoma? We'll move on to macular degeneration. So in macular degeneration, we've talked, we haven't really touched much about OCT and what we can do with OCT. So Lily, why don't you start us off? What, how are you thinking of in macular degeneration? What work do you have going on? And then maybe John can talk a little bit about how he would see the best role for AI in AMD in the clinic. Yeah, so for AMD, uh, and yeah, nothing's as robust as DR, um, there's been really kind of uh, interesting work that's been out there, um, I think, um, uh, by various groups like um, uh, Dr. Bressler's group and other folks that have uh, work, done a lot of really interesting work with the um, ERAS data set. Uh, and then, you know, I think recently had, there was a group that also, um, I think Dr. Grafman also did something with AMD uh, with the ERAS data and then kind of, um, uh, validated in, in a different data set. So there's some, I think there's some beginning work that's been done there. Um, I think uh, the, the interesting question for me is, um, you know, right now when we, we don't really have a robust screening program for AMD, we don't actually screen for AMD in fact, right? Uh, and so, you know, actually thinking through the problem for, for, for me, I was actually thinking, well, okay, how would you implement this? Assuming that you can train algorithm to read whatever image you want, OCT, AMD, blah, 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 whatever, what is the, what is the clinical need you're trying to solve, right? Um, because if patients are already presenting to uh, eye clinic um, and, they're, and they're, looking, um, they're looking, you know, they, they've got CNB, like, I don't know how the ML is going to help. You've got you've got all your specialists there, you know that can tr that can not only detect but also treat. Um, so I, I'm not saying actually I don't have the answers. Actually, I, right now we're I'm trying to 
you know, I'm asking questions. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what is the need in AMD um, that uh, that we feel uh, ML can help with? Because if we don't have screening programs, it not may not be a screening need. Um, and if diagnosis is looking pretty good, you know, um, you know, where 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 is the gap? Uh, is actually what what I'm kind of thinking about. Um, but I'm pretty sure for a lot of these things that uh, you, if you have the defined outp um, output of what the algorithm should be predicting, um, you would you would uh, be able to train an algorithm that does a fairly good job of that. So. John, John, and maybe even Joan, you want to tell us what yeah. the problems yeah, that so Lily can help I think you solve it isn't are? A, it's not a screening issue, but I think prognostic information is a big point. So you know we do that based on on you know sort of examining the fundus and sort of fundus images. So the, the whole the AREDS data is just color photographs, which we don't think is really the best way to analyze an, AM, an eye with AMD. So I would say if you could look at OCTs early on and, and be able to predict you know, the rate of progression, risk for progression, I think there are likely very many subtypes within what we consider either early or intermediate AMD. So that's sort of one piece. And then once you get to the more advanced stages and where we have treatments now, it's understanding you know, who are the responders and non-responders, and by that, I wouldn't use the typical definition, but, you know, who's going to have a good outcome five years down the road? You know, so not, you know, sort of this initial uh, response that we talk, the retina people like to talk about. So if you could use AI to have that, you know, look at the early images and figure out, you know, this person's going to need, you know, three injections, and then they're going to be stable for five years, and, you know, this person going to need injections monthly forever, don't bother, don't ever try to do anything differently. <laughs> You know, that would be very, very helpful and I think would give better patient outcomes. And there, I think that we just had so much data for macular disease in general. We, we talked about OCT, but there's autofluorescence, there's other reflectances, there's OCTA. There's just almost, it's overwhelming to the, to the retina specialist. And I think as we develop better ways to give more sub, sub phenotypes of the disease and also predict progression or, or likely progression to wet or vision loss, that's really where uh, machine learning or AI could help because I think it, it can be overwhelming. Generally, the retina specialist brings the patient in, they're dry, they go home, they're wet, they get an injection, but there's not as, there isn't as much of a time to really sub-analyze, and I think if you could push that out to the clinical uh, imaging devices so that you would be able to more rapidly assess it there in re real time with the patient, that's really going to be the game changer. I think to your other point about the diagnosis dry or what, I mean, I think we also think about when we might have ther new therapeutics for dry. I mean, right now we don't have anything really different to offer to the patient, but I think sc earlier screening uh, at the primary care or uh, general ophthalmologist level, uh, we see a wide variation in, in the diagnosis. We actually see a lot of misdiagnosed cases of AMD in our clinics, and so I think uh, we kind of a similar study to you did with DR would be nice um, as that gets better. Yeah, it is true that, you know, because we don't have anything to do, um, you know, so it's really only once someone becomes really wet that there's something something to treat, which is advanced. So I think the, the last part of our panel, I think we'll talk a little bit about discovery, about the, the black box, as we say. So I remember being on a phone call with Lily two years ago. It was me and an endocrinologist and a couple of other people. And Lily first told us this information that she shared with you is that they could predict people's gender very well based on fundus photographs. The endocrinologist was not at all impressed by this. He's like, I can predict a person's gender by looking at them. <laughs> but, but I, I was, I was actually deeply, I was deeply impressed by this because I can tell you as a retina specialist, I've been looking at funduses for a long time. I've been going to retina meetings for a long time and no one has ever mentioned to me that they could tell the gender based on the fund on the, you know, I don't even know what it is about the fundus photographs. And so that just made me think, this is amazing. This technology could potentially tell us things we have no idea that we're looking at. <laughs> and so I think that's the, the, the topic of this last part is what, uh, where do you see the, where do you see this going? How, how is AI going to become, how is gonna AI going to feed our, our knowledge of things that we don't even know are, we're looking at? Can you talk a little bit about what are you doing in this realm? How is this going to move forward? Uh, yeah, so I, I think one of the things that we, um, one of the hypothesis behind some of the discovery uh, that we've made, or the work that we've done around here was that we think that there are, so there are big, ef there are big effect sizes and there are little effect sizes. So big effect sizes is like, you know, the IRMA 
the, the, the thing that when you see a feature, uh, and it's very highly predictive of some sort of outcome, right? So there's the MAs. That, so these are the, the ones that human beings have picked up in the clinical trials. They're high effect sizes. Um, and, and these high effect size things um, can even be like um, a BRCA mutation or something like that, right? So there are really changes in the population. And then there are these sort of small effect sizes where individually they amount to very little predictive, uh, or they're individually very little predictive value, but together make a really big difference. Um, and so what we've noticed is that um, human beings are really good at the former, not so great at the latter. Uh, machines are kind of sort of good at both. Uh, and they're, they're qualita quantitatively being able to add these little effect sizes up uh, to make a uh, educated, more educated guess, if you will. Um, and so I think that that's probably one of the reasons why, um, you know, the, the gender kind of thing actually, because we, we actually did the heat maps for the, the, the sex prediction. And, you know, we, we, we see a lot of uh, uh, um, attention around the macula and around the disc. But you know, if you black those out, you crop those out, it doesn't take away all the predictive value in the image, right? So it means that the, that the information is kind of in the whole thing. And so that actually informs a lot of the ways that you think about training uh, ML algorithms, right? So uh, rather, if you imagine if, you, if I somehow segmented everything out, uh, instead of using the whole image, uh, I could actually lose, if we're doing discovery, you actually can lose some of the predictive value, right? So it's, uh, it's also a challenge because sometimes some of these images like OCTs, you know, they're, they're 3D and you wanna be able, you, what you wanna do is um, you wanna be able to take the whole volume and train on the whole volume, but that whole volume doesn't fit in a computer and it's really hard to train on that much data, right? So what we do is we say, well, you know, we're gonna segment these things out, draw, you know, draw little segments and segment them out with different layers or, you know, do slice by slice. Um, and we just have to know that when we do stuff like that, it could decrease our predictive power and it could de decrease what's, um, what you can predict. Um, but that's just, you know, that's just the practical limitation of where we are. Um, and of course, we're you know, thinking about techniques where you don't have to you know, feature extract or pull out information um, and you like, feed the whole thing into the network. Um, and so that's actually, so in terms of discovery, this is one of the things that we've um, are, are moving or thinking about more is how do you do end-to-end -end analyses um, rather than picking out features because we think that might, uh, might, might be impactful. Um, and then um, the other thing is, you know, trying to find out, find problems that actually are problems. So the sex thing is not a problem. It's kind of an interesting, like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, but it's not a real clinical problem. And so uh, actually uh, figuring out the real clinical problem which is, you know, will there be visual field loss or something that you actually do care about and can do something about? Um, that's, I think, uh, the, the holy grail of what, you know, what this could, could bring. Um, but we're super duper early, um, and we just have some lessons that we've learned right now about how to set up experiments later. Lloyd, do you want to comment a little bit about the research in AI, the research world in AI? Uh, well, uh, kind of I would agree, uh, just to, to take uh, another step on what Lily was saying, which I totally agree on. The other thing here now, as we build the data sets, and again, for I think right now, part of the limitation is getting large enough volume, highly accurate uh, data sets for this, but eventually, you can act, this will actually be a good diagnostic screening tool also. You'll be able to say, okay, it looks like diabetic retinopathy, A and D. You know, right now, if you had it right, we you can know cutoff levels of triglycerides and uh, uh, and uh, uh, cholesterol, uh, LDL from in the ischemic patients once you go above, above a certain area. So eventually this may be able to also help to an initial uh, triage or ranking of diagnoses the possibilities as well. Um, the other thing that this is uh, uh, very exciting, I think, about, and Lily and I have talked about this before, is trying to utilize this to come up with new biomarkers for certain targets uh, where this all comes together. They say this finding is predictive of these changes, and, and we, we've talked about that since one of our first meetings, uh, where um, we try now to think about what might be important or put some things together, but here's a computer is a much better way of looking at things that some we don't even see and seeing is there an association of those that together is well correlated with your outcome and can be a discovery of new biomarkers, which of course has been a, a major um, target of at least uh, diabetic retinopathy research now for, for the last uh, five years or more. Do we want to uh, see what the fields that are ripe in uh, glaucoma or the questions that are ripe in glaucoma for this? Sure. Uh, we identify the rapidly progressive glaucoma patients, the patients with risk for going blind in their lifetime. In our field, we feel a lot of glaucoma is just like watching the grass grow. A lot of patients are going to be 
just fine. They're not going to go blind in their lifetime. They might be overtreated. But there's this subgroup of patients, and they're a significant minority that they're going to go blind in their lifetime. We would love to be able to use AI to identify those patients early on. And, and that would be so, so important. And I think it could be done. Uh, you need a huge population because I think if you had 100,000 people, uh, only five we're only talking about 5% of that data set. And, and, and to identify what are the biomarkers that are driving them to go on to glaucoma blindness, that's going to be uh, important. I think the other thing, and, and this is, it becomes a logistics issue, but I see a merging of genomics and imaging. Uh, particularly in glaucoma. Of course, the, the issue is, is your genome is identifiable. Uh, and so how do we go about doing this? But so f right now working with Dr. Janie Wiggs and we have an international glaucoma genetics consortium. We have a paper coming out in Nature Genetics saying that just from your DNA, we have with area under the curve, 75% chance of predicting whether you're going to get primary open angle glaucoma. That number is going to increase. So imagine if you had that information plus the imaging information, you really will have a very powerful uh, tool to figure out who's going to get the disease and potentially who's going to go blind from it. You bring it up, we talk a little bit in there, we just thought that with ophthalmology and neurology, and there's a lot of um, ability f to detect new biomarkers for some of these neuro neurology diseases, CNS uh, problems that they don't, that we have better access to, to the retinal tissue or optic nerves. So just combining these images, I think there's a large number of patients that need to be analyzed to really identify those. And you know, our traditional uh, approaches to that are, are, are difficult. Speaking about like Alzheimer's and yeah, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, those types of things. There's some early work, but they're generally smaller, smaller sample sizes. And I think there's a lot of variation in thickness. There's things beyond thickness that we really should be looking at. Uh, and then the, the other follow-up was just on education. I think there is an educational opportunity that uh, came out with your JAMA paper and showing maybe graders that are, are standard deviation below what you would expect. There's an opportunity there to go out and reach out to those providers to help provide an education tool potentially that would help get better access for those patients if they're in more rural or difficult to uh, reach populations. Just a small question, and then we'll actually open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So there, you know, obviously the DR uh, set is a very well-trained set. You have your good gold standard. But there are new imaging technologies that come along and that we have trouble interpreting ourselves. So one that comes to mind is OCTA. <coughs> We're all looking at it saying, what is this? Is there a way that AI can help us to more quickly learn what's important, what we're looking at? For example, in OCTAs, have you thought about that or looked into that at all? Yeah, um, so I, I would say potentially probably, uh, um, but I, I think it, it comes down to um, a big enough data set with the labels that you care about. So I don't know, I'm not an expert in OCTA, uh, nor sort of new imaging modalities, but you know, if, if there's a robust data set where the, you know, your, the functional outcome or the outcome of the patient is, or, you know, is well characterized and well known, you know, the, you know, whether it's pixels or you know, you know, electrical signals or whatever, uh, to the network, it's, it's, just, it's just data and it'll try to make, you know, learn from that data regardless of what that data is. So it is possible, but it's, it's about um, the quality. I mean, yes, it's about the size of the data, but really it's about the quality of the label. Right, um, so uh, you can actually have all the imaging in the world. And this is what we learned, had kind of learned the hard way is that, you know, you can have a lot of images, but um, if you don't know what you want the network to predict, that doesn't really help you. Um, so that's why the reference standard or whatever it is that you're trying to predict, um, you know, we, one, get agreement around it, and two, we, it's actually really something that we clinically care about quite a bit. I think one of the biggest problems with OCTA is the artifact, and I think it's encouraging that the uh, example you showed where the algorithm actually ignored that artifact in the fundus photo in your talk earlier. So I think with OCTA, it's very easy to think you're seeing a neovascular network, but really there's atrophy over it, and it's just showing in a different layer. So I think if there's that ML ability to identify artifacts, it really would help us with OCTA. So I think that's the biggest problem for many of us is the commercially available devices are very hard to interpret uh, whether you're seeing something real or artifact. We, uh, we have time. We have 12 minutes uh, to take questions from the audience. Does anybody have any questions they'd ask, like to ask our esteemed panel? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Uh, hi, uh, so Umid Sabit, Partners Healthcare. Um, my question is uh, related to uh, biomarkers somehow, and also another one related to technology. Um, so uh, Google has another tool uh, called Deep Variant. Uh, it's also very famous in the biomedical field for identifying genomic variation in the population. Uh, can something like this, which also uses TensorFlow and machine learning, be used to integrate into uh, DL or uh, glaucoma identification, you know, uh, as part of predicting it? Or is it, or is Google's model based strictly on image uh, processing for, for glaucoma and, uh, and, and DR? Uh, or if it has it been done, or is, it, is this something that you guys are planning to do in the future? Uh, my second question is uh, unrelated, but it's on the computational side. Is is there advantage, computational advantage, for using TPUs, Google TPUs, uh, tensor tensor processing unit, over say standard Intel or NVIDIA chips to do this kind of TensorFlow calculations uh, for the purpose of recognizing, you know, diseases and conditions? Thank you. So yes, we, we um, uh, I do, fo so my group focus a lot on imaging. We literally sit right next door to the people who um, do deep variant. Actually, Ryan Poplin, one of the first authors for the uh, imaging biomarkers, he's one, of, he's one of the main authors for deep variant. So yes, we work very closely together. In fact, sometimes we're the same people. Uh, and so uh, we, we are definitely very um, excited about the potential of putting, you know, kind of additional things together. Uh, the, there are some interesting things um, about the first, you know, where you want to start with first problems. Like, uh, you know, it has to be, there has to be a big enough data set, obviously, uh, that uh, links the, you know, the gen genomics and genetics with uh, the phenotype outcomes that you have, right? So you can, you can put all of these together, but in the, at the end, you just, you're kind of limited by the population, right? And then also if you, um, like for AMD, there are some genes that have really large effect sizes already that have been found. Um, and so what additional lift are you going to have? Um, I don't know, right? So you actually have to find the right problem as well as the right data set for it. Um, and so we're clearly very interested in this kind of thing, but identifying the right problem to go after uh, is I think pretty critical. Um, and then the second question was around, I think, TPUs. Uh, so it, I guess the question, it, de it depends on your problem. So a lot of the training that we do on, you know, sort of fundus images, there's no need for a TPU. It's just, you know, a GPU will work just fine and, um, and a TPU will make, make it go faster potentially, but if you have multiple GPUs or a lot of CPUs, uh, it's still, you're still fine. Um, I think what's really important for us is uh, for training, how many examples can you fit into memory? And the TPU will allow like an entire, potentially entire volume, like an OCT or something like that. This is, goes back to the end-to-end -end training, right? So we feed, instead of feeding you slices that we then you know, somehow concatenate at the end to make a prediction, uh, we want to potentially put in the entire you know, you know, data set or the entire case, right? Uh, and for something like that, you might actually need a TPU um, for, for sort of that heavyweight type of analysis. For fundus images, generally not. Um, and for some of these things, you might not need that. So it really depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. Hi, I had a global health system problem that uh, question that I hope you can address. It builds up Lloyd's question that you know, with AI and especially in the DR case, you're going to unmask an entirely uh, new cohort of patients. So if you consider India and China, the health system is already overburdened and there's a huge shortage. Uh, have you looked at any application outside Shankara and uh, Arvind? Because these are really well-established systems. Can it support massive skill shifting? Can you have AI support s sustained, consistent clinical decision-making? Because that's the only way these countries are going to solve the big problem of uh, demand and supply. Yeah, um, I think that is that is the question. Um, we don't. I mean, we're clearly not the experts in this, and so we need to partner with the right folks to actually understand how how we do something like this. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the what what AI enables. Um, so so these um, algorithms 
uh, if they're able to, you know, sort of very accurately risk stratify patients. What you need to do is then have the healthcare system uh, or like the operational system sort of respond to that and train mo up more of these type of people who are uniquely, you know, um, positioned to treat the most severe patients, but then the people who aren't severe and really just need counseling, you really need to train up a whole massive force of people that can do that. So whether that is a community health worker or someone with them or a diabetes education counselor, there's, I think, new, um, new uh, roles and jobs that actually need to be filled because of something like this and what this enables, right? Um, also, you know, uh, I mean, even little things like getting the patient, like a patient that is sick, getting them that same day appointment and getting the transportation. Like, so if you're screening in a rural area, how do you get, or an area that's removed, and this is not just in India, it can be anywhere, right? It could be in a city where you just, uh, the, that person just doesn't have a means of transportation, even if it's a same day clinic, you know, understanding how that in itself scales. Now, these are not AI problems, these are implementation problems. Uh, and so that uh, obviously needs to be kind of done, you know, in. I mean, I guess it could be AI problems if you have a self-driving car and you know all that stuff, but it's kind of a stretch, right? Um, so eventually this is, you know, maybe there are a lot of thing, components of this can, that can be automated, but we're looking at this right now, we're trying to have to figure out um, how this changes um, the roles that people have to fill. But I would point out in certain areas, and I think India is the best example of that, these things have been overcome for prior major screening projects, first originally in cataract and then in diabetes, that was actually set down by the the president of India is a major emphasis. So they, uh, they've ex expanded now where they're not still going out to do so many of the camps and so forth, but they have ways of getting the, uh, uh, to the individuals in the rural areas and then actually getting them back in those times. Something like AI could theoretically make that far more efficient because you only have to get the imaging device, if that's what you're working with, out there and then identify who the folks that need to come in and then target only them when they go in the way they had done it before, set up massive ways to be able to go and target everybody and then pull out the people. Uh, so now, the other thing you have to remember, as, I, as I'm sure everybody out here knows, is that that's very dependent on the local situation you're in or the country you're in or the social uh, situation that you're in. It's very different whether you're doing that in India or in China, which is different from Japan and so forth. And so you have to be culturally sensitive within that and also within what the resources are. But some of the areas, like India is a very good example, has been very efficient at getting even surgeries originally out to uh, the rural areas. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, Arnold Lambert from uh, AI Vision. Uh, I was wondering, uh, we saw all these little issues for uh, screening diabetic retinopathy. Uh, the, the people who take the images can actually have an impact on the, the quality of the AI. But I'd like to, uh, to understand how you, how you have tackled the hardware issue because uh, uh, non-mediatic uh, retinographs do tend to be different from one machine to the other. And how do you handle that in an uh, AI system? Uh, so for us, uh, one of the ways that we sort of handle different uh, hardware devices is to make sure you have representative examples of a lot of them. So we make sure that in our training data, we, ha we actually have a lot of cameras um, that uh, are you know, used for training, um, um, you know, taken both mediatic and, and without. Uh, and so that's kind of, um, that's the software end of how you kind of deal with this. And then of course the image quality algorithm is kind of the, the, the stop, which essentially tells you, you know, how, how is the image good enough like, to, for us to make, you know, the, the, the call, right? So if you get an image quality low kind of thing, it basically means that, you know, based on what we got, we, can, we can't give you a confident um, read on what's, what might be there. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, Part of the strategy is, you know, one, um, training on very diverse and large data sets and then um, in different populations with different operators. And then two, kind of having a sort of an algorithm that helps you screen out and, and report back to the clinician your confidence based on what, what you got. So that's kind of one way to, to, to think about it. Um, uh, I think there are other ways in terms of understanding how do you make hardware a little bit easier to use. Uh, and so, you know, the, the optistive devices, for example, um, they're expensive, but they're actually, you know, pretty easy to use compared. So we do actually run like user studies to see, you know, which ones are easy to use, which, what are the failure rates um, uh, for, for those devices. And so the Optus um, does really well, but it's because it's, you know, using lasers and it doesn't have to shoot through. It doesn't use light, uh, not, 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 sorry, just doesn't use, doesn't, um, can have a pretty small pupil and the laser can still kind of get through. Uh, so that's, those are, those are um, kind of in, 
uh, interesting inherent things about hardware uh, and why that can make a difference in kind of image quality. Um, but uh, we're kind of trying to figure out uh, how you can have um, kind of foolproof hardware, but, but also not have it cost so much that it's somewhat prohibitive for a lot of like PCP practices to go forward. I'm Deepa Hussain, I'm one of the retina specialists at Mass Eyenear. So in the clinical practice, we are seeing a big role of sort of multimodal imaging, both for diagnosis and management um, of retinal disease, especially AMD, like you're talking about. Um, what, in terms of AI, is it a way of using multimodal images to integrate, uh, get more or better information? Uh, from you talked briefly about the fact that OCT is three-dimensional and that's hard uh, for AI to uh, sort of get all the information. Is it possible to combine like a fundus photo and an OCT or other forms of multimodal imaging through AI? Yeah, absolutely. So we've, um, you know, the easiest thing is to combine a, you know, fundus image with uh, um, some sort of, you know, uh, point, uh, so like age or pressure or something like that, right? So uh, then that, and you can do that. It's actually quite simple to add that into the network. And the reason why OCT is challenging is because of, it's a three of them that's like, um, it takes up a lot of memory. That's where the TPU question comes in. Like, so you need some uh, hardware that can handle so much stuff in memory, right? Um, and so, you know, you can, but yes, it's not, it's actually to, to the network, so long as you kind of give it the data in the same predictable way, consistent way. So it's like, I'm giving you a fundus image, I'm giving you OCT, we're gonna combine it, and you're gonna make a prediction of you know, a, you know AMD based upon these two things that we're feeding you. Uh, that, that's actually, so we've done some preliminary experiments around it, and it, it's, it's definitely doable. It's just, um, it's just the memory requirements, right? So uh, if, if you just did two fundus images, it'll be, the memory requirements will be lower than if you did like, you know, uh, OCT volume and, uh, and a fundus image. So um, it's not necessarily a question of, is it feasible? Like it is, uh, technically it's feasible, but it's how big of a computer do you need and how many TPUs do you need? Okay. I wanna thank, thank the audience, wanna thank all our panelists, especially thank Lily for traveling out and helping us with this. It's been a great session and Lucia did a wonderful job moderating. Um, so thanks so much. <laughs>